Well, welcome everybody. I'm just delighted. I don't. I can't tell you the last time I've been to a book launch where they had to rush out and find more chairs because there was too many people at the event. I mean, that is quite an accomplishment. And surely that's because of the author's incredible work, this being Walter Dorn's uh, fifth book. Uh, this one, I think definitely the heaviest, Walter. Yeah. This one is the thickest and comes in hardcover as well. Air Power in UN Operations, or as the subtitle goes, which I prefer the most, Wings for Peace. So I just want to say congratulations, Walter Dorn, on this fabulous book. My name is Steve Staples. I am the Vice President of the Rideau Institute, an independent think tank based in, uh, in Ottawa. I also work at ceasefire.ca, and I think probably some folks are on our email list. And uh, we, I know we send out a bunch of invitations, so I'm glad you were able to come and, and join us tonight. Uh, we have a fantastic evening uh, prepared for you. Of course, you'll be able to get your own copy. Uh, Shelley has copies of the book in the back. And I hope you'll be able to, Walter, I hope you brought enough books for everybody, <laughs> frankly. So I think we're going to run out. So be sure and get a copy early. And then at the end, I'm going to drag Walter to the back. And he'll be able to sign your copy for you uh, before you go tonight. Of course, we're joined by uh, two other very distinguished guests who will be uh, speaking tonight. Uh, Dr. Adele Buckley, who will be introducing Walter, and I'll mention her as well. And also, it's just uh, wonderful to be joined by Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, who's here this evening as well. Welcome, General Dallaire. Thank you very much. I have to say, we have um, on our website, uh, we have quite an active group of people on there, and I was asked to make a presentation before uh, General Dallaire's uh, Senate committee a few months ago, and so we posted a little item on the, uh, on the website saying, what would you like me to say to General Dallaire? Leave a comment. Well, the website uh, sputtered, crashed, and then started smoking and just blew up <laughs> from all the traffic that came in, people leaving hundreds and hundreds of comments of people wanting me to pass on so many wonderful ideas to, to uh, General Dallaire. But first, um, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Adele Buckley is going to come up and introduce Walter. And I'm just um, uh, delighted to introduce Adele. She's a physicist, an engineer, and an environmental scientist. And I should say the one thing that connects all four of us together here tonight is that we're all part of the Canadian Pugwash Movement, or the Pugwash Movement, which is an international movement of scientists and engineers and thinkers who are committed to the abolition of nuclear weapons. It was started more than 50 years ago and actually founded right here in Canada and has grown to be an international movement. And I'm sure you're going to hear Pugwash mentioned a little bit later. Dr. Buckley is an aerospace engineer from the University of Toronto. And she also received an honorary uh, doctorate from the U of, T U of T for her work on the transfer of technology into the commercial sector, which ended up creating a company that uh, provided employment for hundreds of scientists uh, and engineers. I've known Adele many years through the Canadian Pugwash Movement. She's also worked on the international Pugwash Movement. But her real passion these days, and I'm sure she's going to tell us a little bit about this, is the Arctic and the need to demilitarize the Arctic, Arctic and make sure that we can have an Arctic that's free of nuclear weapons. Uh, Dr. Buckley and I were at a conference in Denmark a few years ago and we had the opportunity to board um, uh, uh, an Air Greenland flight and flew five hours straight up to the very top of Greenland uh, to the most northern U.S military base in the world, which is at the very tippy top of Greenland in a place called Thule, just like those carriers you see on top of the car, it's named after the same place. And there is a radar station that was built during the Cold War to monitor missile launches. And uh, Adele and I had a chance to have a tour of the base. Now, they like to brag that that was the most northern base that the Americans had. But I have to point out, when we landed on the runway, there was a second plane there waiting for us it was a Hercules waiting to take provisions to go even further north to Canada's most northern base at Alert, 
So we had the most northern base when it came to the Americans. So let me uh, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Adele Buckley, who will introduce Walter Dorn. Thank you, Steve, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, you know thrilled to be here because um, it, it's always useful and, and wonderful when we have newly collected information uh, and that it's permanently available in a book written by experts who understand uh, how air power in UN operations is used in support of peace. Peace is important to. I think everyone. Uh, well, Professor Walter Dorn, right in front of me here, has long been working on scientific and scholarly insights into the prevention and resolution of armed conflicts. That happens to be um, from a, a pugwash statement. But it's, th that is within a civil society framework, and those are my interests as well. And it's not surprising that we became colleagues uh, and we have both served as chair of the Canadian Pugwash Group. It's the uh, national affiliate of the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. And uh, as uh, Steve said, it was founded in uh, Nova Scotia at Thinker's Lodge in 1957. And in the Pugwash Conferences, we have the ability to tap a large reservoir of knowledge. And uh, just recently, uh, I, I just got a little tidbit of information uh, from a colleague that the Canadian Air Force, as early as 1949, was involved in peacekeeping in Indonesia. So uh, you never know what you're going to learn about. Anyway, uh, my expertise is rather narrow. It's in the aerospace technologies and not airplanes, air power, or helicopters. But I do feel safe, I guess, in venturing a comment that the book illustrates that a situation where science is used for the benefit of humanity. And when the UN or another is actually tasked with a specific mission, we certainly would understand that logistics may be complicated, but probably rarely have a chance to appreciate that there are unsung heroes who must solve tricky technical or even basic science problems before the mission can go forward. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Walter had a few questions put to him from time to time. Well, as Steve said, I have devoted uh, some effort to understanding security issues in the Arctic. And uh, in many different places, in fact, seven, seven different countries, I have spoken about uh, why the Arctic should be nuclear weapon free. So just to kind of relate to this evening, I think for air power resources relating to the needs of the Arctic, for example, we should seek funding and personnel to develop aircraft search and rescue te techniques that are specific to a stormy, dark, and hostile Arctic environment, instead of commissioning overflights of bombers capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And then again, we could some use some resources for unmanned aircraft, drones, to deliver relief supplies where infrastructure has failed or to deliver goods of all kinds to help open and develop remote areas of the Arctic, instead of equipping drones to take part in, in armed warfare. So now I have the pleasure of turning this event over to Walter Doran, but you need to know about him. He is a professor of defense studies at the Royal Military College of Canada and the Canadian Forces College. At the Canadian Forces College, he serves as deputy director for graduate studies and chair of the Master of Defense Studies degree. Uh, Dr. Doran is a scientist by training. He has a PhD in chemistry from this university and his doctoral research was aimed at chemical sensing for arms control. He assisted with the negotiation, the ratification, and the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. His interests are broader now, covering both international and human security, especially UN field operations for peacekeeping and peace enforcement. At the Canadian Forces College, he teaches officers of rank, major to brigadier general, and they're from Canada and over 20 other countries. 
this is often a surprise that there are so many countries involved in this. He has direct experience in field missions in such diverse locations as Haiti and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in 1999, he was an electoral office officer with the United Nations Mission in East Timor. And he also served with the UN uh, in Ethiopia um, and at UN headquarters as a training advisor, several times as a consultant with the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, and he carried out for them uh, research in conflict areas in Central and South America, Africa and South Asia, East Asia. Have we any part of the world where we <laughs> haven't mentioned yet? And uh, in 2010, he was a visiting professional in the office of the prosecutor at the International Criminal, Criminal Court at The Hague. And in 2014, he was appointed to the UN's expert panel on technology and innovation in UN peacekeeping. So, of course, I'm very pleased to welcome to the podium Professor Walter Dorn. Friends, thank you so much for coming to share this uh, very happy moment. I feel like a, uh, a newly expecting father, or a proud father of a new academic child. It's been three uh, years in the, in the pregnancy phase, this, this book, and uh, in the end I was so pleased with the results. Um, this is a book that, uh, that, I, that I think we can all enjoy. It's meant to be able to help the world both by furthering our knowledge about this issue of air power and also help those who are practicing, those who are actually flying the planes for the UN and those who are trying to make a difference by applying air power to the cause of peace. Now I realized a long time ago that the world needed such a book and that's one of the things, you, you do your research and then all of a sudden you say, well I'd like to be able to read about this and then as a, as a researcher or a scholar, you realize, oh, there's nothing on it. And then instead of saying, ah, shucks, you say, oh, great. <laughs> that means I have an area where I can explore. And that was the case here, where I could explore how uh, the UN could use air power. Originally, I titled the book, uh, Wings for Peace, and put in subtitle, um, Air Power and UN Operations. Well, the publisher wanted me to, to, to do the reverse. But what I liked about the title is that it included both the hard power, that is the power aspect, and also the soft power, the necessity for a vision for a world at peace, and the wings for peace being um, a sense of, of something from a higher perspective and, and aspirational, and at the same time had a feeling of, of, uh, of joy to it. So I wanted in the book to be able to present the bigger picture. Um, most of the time, peacekeeping is seen as soldiers on the ground doing their patrols. But the peacekeepers of the air have not been given their due, and it certainly was necessary. So I brought together a group of, um, of experts from, who are practitioners, peacekeepers uh, from the ground and the air, and uh, brought them to the Canadian Air Forces Aerospace Warfare Center in Trenton, which is Canada's largest air base. And we discussed the different ways that, we, that air power could be used. And when I saw what we had compiled, I thought, okay, this is the basis for the, the book that I had in mind. And we wanted to expand it to not just be peacekeeping, but also be enforcement, UN enforcement. So we got a chapter from a Swiss uh, expert on, on doctrine, on air doctrine, on the Libya operation, in 2011 operation, uh, bring in there. And I had my previous publisher, which was UN University Press, based in Tokyo, and they were willing to consider it for, for publication. They sent it out for review, came back okay with the review, and just as the manuscript was finally ready for submission, the new rector of the university, David Malone, decided to close the press. So here I was with, uh, with a, a, a fetus, you might say, and I had to figure out where, who was going to carry it. Well, the UN University Press uh, suggested Ashgate Press in the United uh, Kingdom, and they took it on, and, and uh, it went out for peer review. It came back with a very negative review, actually. But fortunately, it, the press realized that it was the review that was deeply flawed and not the book. So it's been really great to work with Ashgate to this very day. Um, they are a publisher that likes to provide to libraries. So they said the price of the book would be $120, and I went gulp. How can I possibly 
asked my friends and, and colleagues to buy a book for $120. Only libraries could do that. But uh, fortunately, the uh, Canadian Air Force Heritage Fund, who uh, receives their, their funds themselves every year from the, from the uh, Winnipeg Jets, they get a, an endowment. And they said, well, no problem. We will cover the cost of a, a heart, soft cover. So I went to Ashgate and said, look, we can subsidize a soft cover book. We'll give you 3,000 pounds. And they said, that's great. So uh, then finally, when it came out, the soft cover came out, I saw it was $49 US. And I went, gulp, that's still too much. So Ashgate has very kindly said that uh, to my uh, friends and colleagues, and for this evening, I could sell it at half price. So you're getting it at $29 Canadian. And uh, I think that's not bad for a book that uh, Steve said is uh, 350 pages long. Well, I wanted to share a little bit with you about um, my background and why, why I'm dedicated to this cause. Uh, I must have put in hundreds of hours of volunteer uh, service looking at this cause of peacekeeping, made over 200 trips to New York, and uh, felt that this was a cause that was well worth dedicating my life to. I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to uh, the Science of Peace Movement, founded here in, in 1981 um, at the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference here. And I was a starry-eyed undergraduate student. Um, I thought all professors were gods. Boy, do I know that is wrong these days, <laughs> having become one. And uh, the movement was founded here with uh, George Ignatiev, Anatole Rappaport, Eric Fawcett, some of these great thinkers at the University of Toronto who really wanted to make a difference and prevent a nuclear war. And uh, they applied for status at the United Nations as a non-governmental organization in affiliation with the Department of Public Information. And I was uh, down at the uh, United Nations just on a tour, doing a regular tour as what I must have been around um, oh, 20 or 21 years old. And I made an inquiry, how is the application that Science for Peace has made to the United Nations going? And the person uh, at the UN told me, oh, we're so sorry. We misfiled the application during the summer. We're going to get right on it. We'll give you an answer within uh, two weeks. So I went to the next meeting of Science for Peace, which is held in the McLennan Physics Labs, right next to the, the uh, Lashmiller Chemistry Building, which was gonna, then going to become my home for uh, almost, uh, almost six uh, to eight years. And um, I, I was able to say, yes, the Science for Peace application is on track. And I found myself uh, very, just out of fluke, being sort of the hero of the day for getting the application on track, for simply making an inquiry at the UN. And within half a year, they asked me to be the representative to the United Nations in New York. And I said, well, I know nothing about the UN, but I can learn. And five years later, I had, I had learned enough. I was able to write a book on peacekeeping satellites, the case for international surveillance and verification. And that was still uh, during, the, during the Cold War and I was looking at how the UN could acquire its own satellites. Well, um, that uh, sort of hobby of mine, while I was continuing my studies in chemistry and physics, became the passion. So what I was moonlighting in became the, my career, and by the time I'd, I'd done the PhD in 95, here graduating at Convocation Hall, I realized I am in the wrong field. Uh, I wanted to work in, in conflict, peace and conflict studies. I was an associate next door at University College in the peace and conflict studies program at the St. Hilda's uh, International Relations program that was ho housed there at the time. And yet I was floating around and, and one of the professors uh, said to me, you'll never get a job in this field because you got your PhD in the wrong area. I had a degree in physical chemistry. But I tried to apply it to arms control. And then I was also trying to see how can I use a background in a completely different field. Well, I ended up uh, deploying to the field. I, I felt it wasn't enough to just talk about peacekeeping. I wanted to do it. And I had missed out on the big opportunities in Bosnia and Cambodia and, and Rwanda and, and other areas. I was still working on that PhD. So I ended up um, going to the mission in 1999 in East Timor, which was the best and worst experience of my life. The best experience because I felt every day a sense of meaning as I would get up in the morning. Here we were, a United Nations mission of 500 electoral officers and 50 military liaison officers, offering to a people who had been subject to colonization and occupation for 450 years. And we were telling them, here you have a chance to be able to vote for your future. And for the first time, they were actually asked about their opinion about what, what should become of, of their territory, their half island of Timor. 
and they were full, full of questions, you know, how am I sure the ballot's going to be secret? Uh, are you sure that, that there won't be repercussions against us? And, and I would repeat the UN lines, no matter what the outcome of the referendum, we will not abandon you. The UN is here to stay. If you decide to join with Indonesia as the 27th province, we will help uh, implement the, the agreement that's been reached with Jakarta. If you decide you want independence, we will be here to help you tr um, with the independence. So the vote came and it was a model vote. It was almost no violence and we were all delighted. And then I went back to UN headquarters and was observing from there and the vote uh, was announced six days later. And within hours, the militia started their campaign. They uh, started burning and looting. And within, uh, within a matter of days, 90% of the capital, Dili, had been burnt down. And my translator and her family had been forced at gunpoint onto a boat and been shipped to West Timor. And uh, the people that I knew were being killed. In fact, one of my workers who had been uh, providing me with information about false registration he had gone to the Swai church in order to find refuge there after the militia had come to his house. They actually had threatened his mother that if he continued to cooperate with the UN, then he would be killed. So he took refuge at the Swai Cathedral. And, um, and I, was, I had visited him there and, and tried to make sure that he was okay. Now at the time of the September 6th um, voting announcement, there was an attack on that church, and I'm, I'm sad to say, that he was killed in that slaughter with, along with 200 other people. And I was um, in Ottawa lobbying. I was in front of a foreign affairs building saying we need a peacekeeping force. I was doing everything I could. Um, the East Timor Alert Network called me their suit man to try and get uh, the word on, on television about how we need to get involved in, in Timor. Unfortunately, it wasn't another Rwanda. I was, I was saved from post-traumatic stress disorder. But the fact that within 10 days, an Australian-led intervention force came in and we had learned the very painful lesson more than anyone else in this room. Senator, uh, Lieutenant General Dallaire uh, bears the scars of that mission. And we had learned uh, a lesson from Rwanda and we had intervened and saved. And my, within one month, my translator was able to get back to, to Dili and um, the people were saved. And it was two years of transitional administration. Now in the depths of that suffering, where I'd wake up and I'd, I'd hear about places where I had been, where there was a massacre, people I knew who had been killed, I had to resort, resort to poetry. And I'd like to read to you a poem called The Tribute of a Timor Lover, which was uh, really a motivation for trying to continue to work in this. I, I know that Romeo Dallaire and I both have um, had the experience him in a much more profound and, and much more hurtful fashion of having had, um, had people we know killed during a peacekeeping operation, and we, we want to make sure that it works well. This is my way of, of being able to um, pay tribute to the, the great people of Timor who suffered through the reign of terror. O Timor, how great has been your suffering. How many sons and daughters you've lost in the struggle. How many fruits you've been denied through the centuries. Still the fairest fruit is soon to be yours, independence. You paid the price with the sweat of your brow, with the blood of your people, under the whip of foreign taskmasters. Struggle, cry, and work, all these you did. Finally, the world heard your cry and recognized your struggle. We, the United Nations, came to help you determine your future. We said, your choice, your vote, your future, we are with you. But we were wrong. We allowed ourselves to believe that your oppressor would become your protector. We led you to the pasture, but forgot that it was the location of a slaughterhouse. It was your vote, it was your choice, but it was not your future altogether. We stood by and then left you as we were evacuated. We stood by and then left you as the forces of darkness and prejudice enveloped your land. Now we return to count the dead and help the living. Still, many of your people remain in the jaws of terror. This was written still um, during the reign of terror, and just as the international forces were intervening. They remain in the jaws of terror in another land under the control of another power. May they remain, return quickly to you to be embraced by you, O Timor. 
Through the darkest hours, you kept the flame of hope alive in your heart. You dared against fate and foreign oppression to believe in your future. And now from the spirits of your fallen and the hearts of your willing will surely bring the goal supreme freedom. Those of your admirers who love your natural beauty, cherish your humility, will pledge to do what we can to make your independence dream a reality, your freedom a celebration, and your security a matter, a matter of our own. May God give us the strength never to fail you again. Viva Timor Leste. And that's the story that, that's the motivation behind the book. When I came back from Timor, I said I needed to help find a place where I could work and I could work on peacekeeping issues. And it was, it was the Canadian military that embraced me, that said, yes, we can appreciate that your PhD is in the wrong field, you can't, uh, but we'll make you a professor of political science. They did it based on the military tradition that, that people who had worked as engineers and in different areas could take on capacities that were outside of their field. And so I was rather surreptitiously uh, invited to join the Royal Military College in the year 2000 after coming back. And in the back of my mind was, how can I apply the science and the technology to peacekeeping? And I was working at surveillance technologies, the subject of my 2010 book, Keeping Watch, Monitoring Surveillance and Technologies in UN Peacekeeping. But I had, ever since I was a boy, admired aircraft. I, uh, my first job I ever wanted to have when I was a boy was to become a pilot. And I had a fascination with aircraft. And, and um, when I saw that there was, as I said earlier, a gap in the literature, and also a gap in the knowledge and that UN headquarters staff didn't have any reference sources, I said, this is the opportunity. So I quickly assembled together a team to do studies on this area, uh, did a conference at CFOC in uh, Trenton, and we resulted in a wonderful conference, and we were delighted to have General Dallaire providing the keynote address in 2011 at the, um, the conference Wings for Peace. And today we have the fruits of that conference, the book, keep, uh, the book we have now, um, air power and human operations means for peace. And again tonight, we're delighted to have Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire coming with us, and I'll be very pleased to introduce him in a few minutes. The last remarks I have is about the world of today. We've seen a, a, a rather unfortunate turn of events in the last few years in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. And for me, the solution to those problems are individual accountability for acts of atrocity, uh, negotiations for a, um, some sort of settlement between the warring fractions, and a peacekeeping force. I believe that one is needed in Afghanistan, a UNAMA-2 force to take over from a very small 20 military personnel force uh, mission now, UNAMA-1, UN Assistance Mission in, in Afghanistan. We'll need one for Iraq to be able to help keep peace there between the different militia groups that have grown and indeed the terrorist groups that have grown there. We'll need one for Syria when they finally come to the negotiating table. Like in Bosnia, it took many years of painstaking efforts. We'll need to have a robust force there. And I was deployed in the Congo, uh, deployed, sent by UN headquarters in, in July of this year. We were looking at the technologies deployed in MONUSCO force. We saw the operation, including the Force Intervention Brigade, and I was very much encouraged to see that the UN had actually given an element of its force an offensive mandate. The words in the Security Council resolution are actually uh, that they can use offensive measures against groups like the Lord's Resistance Army, like the um, groups, the CNDP, and the successor organizations, the M23, that were ravaging, pillaging, raping, uh, making uh, the Eastern Congo what I call the wild east of the world. So in all those cases, the, there's a role for peacekeeping, and I appreciate all of you coming out tonight as you show your support for this concept that yes, that the, the world's problems require the world's solutions, and that we have to be able to provide the means. And hopefully, I, 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 I hope, I beg, I pray that the Canadian, Royal Canadian Air Force will one day become a major instrument again for peacekeeping forces. And it's uh, with that in mind that I'm delighted to be back here at the University of Toronto where I had my origins as a peace researcher, uh, where I, uh, was a neophyte and had so many, including people in the audience, as my mentors and guides. And now I can finally share the fruits of that effort and the fruits of the experiences I've had with you all here today with the um, proud new child, the academic child, Air Power and UN Operations Wings for Peace. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Walter, that was amazing. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your inspiring story and for sharing with us your profound commitment to peace and your dedication, and your passion, and your knowledge. And I have to say, it's, uh, it's reassuring to know that um, at the Canadian Forces College just down the road here where uh, the Canadian military leadership um, is, is schooled in, in history and theory, that there's a guy like Walter Dorn in there standing up in front of the classroom, that there's a space for these kinds of views and this kind of dedication at the Canadian Forces College. And I think that is um, uh, just wonderful to have such a strong champion of peacekeeping, a real uh, Canadian value known around the world right there in the heart of the Canadian Forces College and now being shared in amazing books like this with other people interested in peacekeeping around the world. Uh, I'm going to ask Walter to come up to uh, introduce to you uh, probably the most famous peacekeeper of them all, Senator Angelina. Yeah. Uh, General Dallaire and uh, all friends and colleagues in the audience, it really is a pleasure to have this individual today here with us. We, um, we all in our hearts um, have empathized with the suffering that he went through. We all in our hearts wanted to be able to help him as an individual. I'm delighted that, that Canada and the world has been able to learn from his experiences, be able to appreciate for who he is as an individual, and that um, he's able to be with us and share from the heart tonight. Now, uh, former Senator, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire has had a very distinguished career in the armed forces. Um, he's uh, been a, a soldier with a cause, and the cause has been the peace of the world. And when he was deployed um, into, into Rwanda in um, 1993, it was, a, it was a, a new mission for the UN. We had seen the mission in Cambodia take on such a wide breadth of mandate and um, it seemed to be a success. And then the Arusha Accords gave General Dallaire wide scope for implementation, but the UN unfortunately didn't give him the means. And um, there was tremendous political problems. But if you want to know an individual could take what he has and make a difference on the ground, it's General Dallaire. He saved 20 to 30,000 lives in places like Amhoro Stadium, in places like the King Faisal Hospital. He was able to uh, show tremendous courage himself going out to the field. It, having to face the dead bodies, the atrocities that went on, the evidence of the war crimes, and look, stare them in the face. And as the title of his famous book, which subsequently became a movie of the same title, and a documentary of the same title, Shake Hands of the Devil, he had to shake hands with people who were the instruments of the devil. There were over half a million people slaughtered, mostly because they were of one ethnic group. In fact, the story of, um, of early warning was written in uh, General Dallaire's cables of January 1994. He had a um, person with a conscience come to his, his office, one to be called Jean-Pierre. He was responsible for the militia in the Kigali area, the Hutu power militia. And he had been asked to compile a list of names of all the Tutsis, which he thought was for their extermination. He was uh, trained um, people, his militia, to kill a thousand people in 20 minutes. And um, he was deliberately going to target the United Nations as um, the way to help remove the Belgians from the mission, which, which were the people who could, could start it. General Dallaire made a desperate plea for help. He sent his colleague, General Barry, um, whom I've also spoken with about those days, a message using a famous motto from the Van Dus, Pusikave, where there's a will, there was a way. Well, friends, there wasn't a will in that case. The international community abandoned the mission in, in uh, Rwanda. The Security Council mandated it to go from, from several thousand down to 300 personnel, 250. I think General Dallaire managed to keep almost 300 there. But with those 300 brave individuals, they managed to save many lives and make a difference on the ground. And for that, we owe him a debt of gratitude for saving our fellow human beings uh, in, in Africa and for uh, showing the heroism and the courage that he did 
And then not only that, then afterwards, carrying his message to all of us, touching our hearts and increasing our dedication to cause. And, you know, that was one of the missions that helped make me feel that I had to go to the field, had to make a difference. I suffered an iota of what he had suffered in the field, but um, he has remained ever since a great inspiration. And I know from all of our hearts, your heart, General, we thank you so much for your dedication and we welcome you here tonight. Very kind. Thank you. It's very kind of you, but you're cutting into my speaking time here. <laughs> Walter, uh, bravo, well done, and uh, lovely to see um, uh, the application of intellectual rigor uh, into the world of the operational art uh, of not only war fighting but of peacekeeping, peacemaking, and in fact, uh, bringing peace uh, to the world. Um, I'm taken aback by the title still, uh, since uh, I first was asked to write a little blurb on it, because uh, Walter has pushed the envelope of the UN, sort of UNEs, if we would call it. Um, one would expect that if you're talking about the UN, you would not start with a term called air power. Uh, that would tend to make people very, very nervous. Starting it with the wings of peace as the title and then air power camouflage somewhere in there, that probably would have made the people a lot easier. But then again, maybe they didn't, wouldn't get the point. And I think that's why it was important to project it this way, is that we are speaking uh, of air power and its cap capabilities as force multipliers in peacekeeping, not only some of its history, uh, which is short, but what we project into the future and the incredible complexity and ambiguity uh, of these missions that we're facing in the world. And because of that, uh, we are still in a very steep learning curve, particularly since the end of the Cold War, uh, the postmodern era, where we are ending up in failing states uh, and imploding nations. We're ending up in civil wars uh, created by factions, either because of ethnicity, tribalism, uh, religion, uh, and sometimes one might even say worse, by simply not wanting to share power. And in so doing, using those other instruments to achieve their power base. And so in this era in which we've really stumbled into uh, we're trying to figure out what exactly will be the requirement to not respond to crises uh, and not, in fact, to make peace, but in fact, how do we prevent conflict? The ultimate aim is to prevent it. I mean, that makes far more sense than simply coming in afterwards to pick up the pieces or to join in the middle of it and see what you might be able to salvage. And so one of the thrusts that we are finally starting to see coming out of the UN and different bodies around the world is the word prevention. That is a massive leap forward, a massive leap forward, because prevention is far more complex than resolution. Imagine politically getting into prevention. We prevented something from happening. How do you explain that to the Treasury Board? How do you explain why we have used all these resources to prevent something from happening uh, and have the metrics needed to be able to defend what resources you did use and also uh, to get the kudos on your political capital when you said, well, we prevented that from happening. Yeah, but nothing happened. Well, we agree. So, there's also the more risky exercise in prevention politically, and that is, what if things go to pot? What if you did participate in attempting to prevent and the thing did not work? That you're in the midst of, in fact, a growing catastrophe, 
And there, how, not to extricate yourself, but how do you explain that you weren't part of aiding and abetting the problem? How can you explain that, in fact, uh, you were not part of the causes of the problem in these very complex, multidiscipline, multifaceted conflicts that civil wars and imploding nations are bringing about? And so, politically, you're not going to get a lot of people wanting to play. And because of that, you've got to work just that much harder to bring in new capabilities, new solutions, for the politicians to get a more warmer, fuzzy feeling that ultimately they can commit. And in fact, in doing so, uh, they are not losing political capital, but in fact, maybe gaining it. And by the by, maybe they're doing also the right thing, which is kind of nice to know that maybe that's what really they wanted to do in the first place. So what do you do to wrest the initiative from the enemy, from the belligerents, uh, from either state-based belligerents, non-state actors, spoilers who are in there just to, to make the thing more possible? How do you wrest the initiative when there are no front lines? There are no Cartesian references that we're used to. This is not the Western Front where they spent four years on the same trench nearly. We are talking about all around defense, all around opposition, of not being able necessarily to discern who might be the good guy and the bad guy. Imagine you're standing there teaching a new generation of, you hope, security forces like policemen in a country, and all of a sudden one of them steps up and shoots you or has shot people in the other classroom because that individual is of another belief and has infiltrated the process and is ultimately trying to undermine it. I mean, that gets a little complicated to really know the good guys from the bad guys. And knowing the good guys from the bad guys is also a little complicated. Are they really good guys and bad guys? Are they all bad guys? Are some of them good? Uh, and that tends to be a problematic in when you look at the ambitions of different players in many of these conflicts, particularly when it's going into the realm of power sharing where they're still struggling with the concepts of democracy, uh, of human rights, of rule of law, uh, of gender equality. Uh, and in the midst of that, uh, you have a sectarian conflict and conflicts due to these other factors. So ladies and gentlemen, Walter sort of not only participated with us in stumbling into this era, he sort of fell right into the midst of it in trying to figure out what's new out there that might bring a bit of an edge to bringing some solutions that might ultimately even prevent. And so the dimension or the third dimension, the air dimension, uh, comes to the fore. And in that, I think that one must uh, take a boo at what it's been so far to the UN and maybe, hopefully, a projection into the future, which Walter is doing. And that's why I recommend the book, if you are at all interested in conflict prevention. If you're interested in more sort of picking up the pieces afterwards and rehabilitation and reintegration, well, fine, that may not be what you're looking at as a primary source. And if you're in there only because you've been forced to uh, in the midst of a problem, this also may not necessarily be your primary uh, reference. But if you're in there because you want to see how things can be prevented by force multipliers of a variety of sources and how you can actually prevent people from going catastrophic, well, yeah, then, then it's a very good reference. And it's a good reference because it's introducing something that was sort of not in the realm of the concept of peacekeeping, and that is the application of technology. For peacekeeping, if I ask you what it is, it is blue berets, short pants, a baseball bat, and no red card, right? Or no penalty box. The good guy is standing there because everybody thinks that there's a worthy moral ground in which they can stand, and in so doing, they can be your referee so that people from whatever side are able to ensure that the other side's playing by the rules. 
And so that's essentially what peacekeeping was. Particularly, it was by nation states against nation states. So they finally come to an agreement. They need a referee to make sure it works. We go in there and we keep an eye on things and we help them uh, relieve some of the frictions to, in order to bring about the peace process. But what happens when you try to apply that within the nation? When you've got factions who have been at it for hundreds of years? When you've got elements that are beyond political but are fundamental to the problematic? How do you discern then some of these solutions? And that's where the difficulty arises uh, in this era of complexity and ambiguity. And that's why uh, we continue to seek out that, hey, peacekeeping, peacemaking, is simply a terminology that may have had its full day, but now we're into conflict. We're into conflict resolution. We're into conflict prevention. That's what we want. And it's multidisciplinary and far broader in what it's touching upon and what the solutions may require. And in so doing, uh, it needs a whole new spectrum of capabilities and maybe an, even an inventory of capabilities, of which air power is in there. But when I use that term, and when you sort of hear that term, you immediately sort of turn to World War II and wiping out Dresden. You know, and sort of, you know, oh, well, that's how we sort things out. Uh, and, uh, you know, we diminish the capability of the enemy. And then after that, we roll in on the ground and then we, we win. And that might have been, in fact, a methodology, certainly not an economic one, but it was a methodology. And it was certainly not necessarily ethically easy in the context of destroying human uh, will to fight or to support the fight. Uh, but it was of that era. That era was diplomats and politicians argue, discuss, try to find solutions, can't. They turn to the generals and they say, take our youth, go out there, fight and win. And after that, we'll go in and we'll try to help them rebuild. A very sequential sort of construct. All that went to hell at the end of the Cold War. And with this new era of not going to war, which we use all left, right, and center still today, but we're going into conflicts in which all these things are happening at the same time. You're into fighting an enemy force that is trying to undermine the structure of the nation. You're trying to help them rebuild their infrastructure, be it through the people, through the structures, through the the rule of law, the judicial process, and on and on and on. And by the by, you're also in there with the humanitarian assistance because you've got massive numbers of people who are displaced and internally, uh, internally displaced and refugee. But they're all working at the same time. And that means you need a whole new set of capabilities. A general who knows only how to fight is useless in this era. A diplomat who understands only really complex and interesting words and tournure de France is also useless in this era. Someone who can only adapt what the Cold War tools, which is of the old era of classic war and peace, somebody who can only adapt those terminologies and, so, and try to make them work now is also useless. What you need is people who are multidisciplined people who are capable of grasping the complexity of all the disciplines at play at the same time and in fact integrate them. Not keep them in their silos, not keep them in their sort of stovepipes, but how do you cross them in and how do you create something new? For conflict prevention, contrary to conflict resolution or rehabilitation, is actually bringing something fundamentally new to the table. Creating a new capability. Creating a new multidisciplinary capability. Bringing a new way that all these different elements from security to politics to diplomacy to nation building to uh, uh, humanitarian aid all actually get to work together under a leadership that understands how they can work together and assist them doing that. That's the framework 
in which Walter is introducing this new capability. There was a, a gentleman called Birchall, ended up as a general. He was Air Force. Uh, he is known as the savior of Ceylon. Why? Because in World War II, he was flying an air reconnaissance aircraft, uh, sort of uh, naval air. And uh, he, in that patrol, spotted a massive Japanese uh, fleet that was going to actually take by surprise a significant Anglo-American capability fleet. And he had just enough time to radio that information before he was shot down. And he ended up as a prisoner of war for over three years. And during the three years, demonstrated a leadership that is similar to what you see in the movie uh, Bridge Over River Kwai. Uh, and he was of that elk of leadership and a person. That's an, an air power of the classic sense, right? The constant thought, use of force, uh, kinetic force, and then uh, the battle was won by one side and the other was defeated. But that's not the, the realm of the air power as such in which uh, Walter is working on and is trying to introduce into uh, the realm of the UN and of this conflict prevention mode. It's got a multifaceted uh, dimension to it into the future, just as it was sort of embryonic in the past. I'll give you a couple of very uh, simple examples. Um, we, uh, in the mission that I commanded, uh, ended up in a country that was completely isolated in the world. I mean, there was no, uh, no seaport. It was in the midst of Africa, surrounded by other countries. Uh, and so the only way you could get resources in uh, one way or another was either by road, which were blocked and of course uh, prevented both by people uh, in the country, but also by people around who didn't want to be participatory in any one side or the other, or by air. And so to this day, the mere fact of hearing a Hercules aircraft engine brings to me the fact that I was able to stay on the ground in Rwanda. I was able to get some food and medical supplies and water in, not only for my troops, but for some of the people uh, that we were protecting. I also knew that if some of them, in the accomplishment of their duties, were injured, shot at, killed, or probably, hopefully not killed, that I was able to evacuate them, and they had a chance of surviving. And so, in the midst of that complete isolation, with one phone working, and the whole world outside, the only thing that was able to get in was air power, was those aircraft. And yes, some of them looked nearly like Swiss cheese at the end of it, not shot down, but the resiliency of that air capability, that air transport capability, and the willingness to use it as an offensive tool to prevent me from having to pull out, thus permitting me and my force to stay in, to witness the genocide, and to save, we hope, the thousands of people that we did, is an indicator that this capability was a capability that, in fact, if it wasn't available, would have meant the whole elimination of the mission. So we're, we're into a scenario where it was a saving instrument of that. There's other uh, arenas. I was recently uh, in the Eastern Congo, and Walter was speaking of that, Goma, he's talking about the FDLR, the M23, and all the fighting going on in the Kivu areas, and and uh, the Ituri and so on, and also in the northern uh, 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 Congo and also southern Sudan. And there you have uh, an exercise going on uh, where this guy, Joseph Kony, is creating havoc beyond the scale because of the ruthlessness uh, of what he is doing and the fact that he is also using child soldiers. And when you're using child soldiers, you're, that is a dead indicator that the ruthlessness will go to extremes, which includes mass, mass atrocities and even genocide. Because the youth, can, you can push them to those extremes because their reference points are simply not developed at that and you can indoctrinate them, drug them up and, and so on. 
So uh, as I'm in there and having met with the special forces, the US and Tampa, I was meeting with the 100 American forces there who were helping the Congolese, the Ugandans in particular, uh, in trying to go after Kony. And although they were getting troops on the ground, there was no way they were going to be able to get at Kony. Why? Because they're moving at the same speed that Kony is moving on the ground. And no matter how much you could get a word back to you that, oh, he's been here, the ability to get there in time and go after a rebel force or a, a, a terrorist force like that, you've got to be there at the time or even before to get them. Well, there was no way and no way anybody would be able to stop him. And so the initiative stayed with it and is still, in fact, with him. I, I suspect he's working even at the Central African Republic now. However, if we had deployed helicopters, if we had deployed RPVs with night vision capabilities, infrared and so on, where we can observe general areas and interpret what's going on and move forces fast enough to block Kony from his retreat, to surround him, well, that's a whole different exercise. You wouldn't even need 5,000 troops. But we don't give them helicopters, and so we let them go on the ground with thousands of troops wasting all kinds of resources and taking casualties unnecessary, and the guy still is running around loose. So what you've got there is a capability that is cheap. You can get in uh, hundreds if you really want uh, light helicopters, and you can deploy them and deploy them effectively in order to achieve the aim. Well, that's another tool. Recently, also, you've seen in the Congo uh, the fact that they're using now attack helicopters. Uh, the intervention force, which is using offensive operations, are using attack helicopters. That's an incredible force multiplier in going after uh, people who are and have engaged in kinetic operations against your forces. Uh, and the mere fact, as Walter has indicated, that the UN is using in its chapter 7 now, no more the chapter 6 short pants and blue berets, but chapter 7 with a blue helmet. So peacekeeping is blue helmet, no more blue beret. It's blue helmet. And in that construct, uh, the ability of them to accept the term offense to accept the other side that Walter is pushing is the gathering of intelligence, the collating of that intelligence, and the dissemination of it for forces that can move by, by air means is also nearly revolutionary. For intelligence gathering was foreign to the UN, you could get information. But information, of course, meant that you couldn't use all the different tools that might be available to you if you're doing it from an intelligence perspective, be they civilian or military. And offensive operations was an absolute no-no. I was not permitted to use offensive operations to go after all those arms caches that we knew would be used by the bad guys to conduct the, the civil war and ultimately the genocide. And one of the reasons was, is in my faxes, I used the term offensive operations which was essentially by mandate illegal. And so if I use maybe the deterrent, that might have worked, but offensive did not work. And so we have recognized that we have to be uh, proactive and anticipatory, but also capable of projecting offensive capabilities. And the use of air power is a significant factor in that. So that's sort of what's been going on but what about the future? How, in fact, will that be used? I think Walter touches on a number of new arenas and new capabilities of technology for the future. And that's a very significant factor because in comparison to deploying right now 110,000 peacekeepers around the world, you can save a lot of lives, a lot of frustrations, and in fact, a lot of mistakes by moving a lot more air assets 
to these conflicts and not have them under civilian control where somebody is counting the number of air hours and how much that fuel is costing you, but using them by an operational commander's authority and not a civilian budgetary authority, which has been the dominant means by which air power has been controlled up to now. I could say what I wanted for my helicopters, but if the civilian staff who's running the budget of the mission says, we don't have the money to buy the fuel, so you're limited so many hours, then I really can't use that asset. And so that shift has now happened in which, in fact, the demand for air hours to be able to do it is very much right in the heart of the operational uh, theater uh, commanders. Take a country like Rwanda uh, as a theater of operations, and I'm ebbing so that you don't all fall off your chairs and fatigue. Uh, take a country like that. It's about 250 kilometers by 200 kilometers. This is not a huge portion of land. However, it's got a thousand hills, which means it's got maybe 2,000 valleys. And it's got rivers and ravines and hiding places and a bit of forest. And so the question is, is how do you maintain observation on this territory? Remembering that we're talking observation of the whole territory, because you're in a civil war. You don't know from what angle these guys are coming. The good guys, how they're, do, they're holding off, and whether they're doing good things, or the bad guys uh, who are trying to destabilize it, well, how are they operating, and from what angle are they coming in, and how are they maneuvering? And so how do you cover that much territory? just to handle a city of about 600,000, like Kigali with its hills and so on, would have cost us close to 35,000 troops. Urban warfare is the most costly and complex of all types of operations. It just sucks and sucks and sucks more resources. However, if you take that problematic and also the whole land mass, and are able to look at it from another angle. But you're able to look at it all weather, because you do have fog, you do have some monsoon period. You look at it day and night, 24-7. It makes it difficult for those who are maneuvering outside of the parameters of what the rules of engagement have established because the mandate said no fighting, you know, peace agreement, or uh, we are providing security and protection for the civilians. And so anybody who is operating with any sense uh, of attack or assault or uh, intimidation of civilians, we can uh, intervene. If you have a capability that's blanketing the country 24-7 and have the capability that's taken all that information, collating it, with the analysis and then disseminating it in a timely fashion to those who can react, well, you have a force multiplier of unequal capability. And so the realm of the uh, UAVs, the realm of the much lower level capabilities, the near static capabilities at the low level that are observing, that can stay up there for hours upon hours and you can barely hear it or see it, but have enormous uh, visual capabilities and command centers that can bring all this stuff together. That would have been incredible. We wouldn't have been surprised. And so, although it seems sort of a bit much to ask, when you compare that, that capability with the cost of putting tens of thousands of troops on the ground, I mean, we're in two completely different realms. And so, it's not only a force multiplier and a higher level of guarantee of surveillance that gives you a better guarantee of protection of civilians, but it is a lot more cost effective. And in so doing, less threatening, and particularly less threatening for politicians in countries like ours who are now adverse to the UN, adverse to casualties, 
in far off lands where we think that what's happening there is really not of our consequence. And so instead of deploying thousands of troops, they're deploying technology capabilities that have limited numbers of troops and in fact have a higher possibility of success. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Walter is pushing us into trying to get ahead of the game using technology from the air. And I would argue that that's a dimension that is still underestimated. Underestimated on the different planes from cost effectiveness to outright operational effectiveness. And in so doing, by us not investing in that capability, uh, we will continue to have decisions in regards to our political masters that are going to be adverse to wanting to get in there even when the conflict has started, let alone even wanting to take the risk of going in early and being able to observe the situation and control it and then be able to react proactively uh, to uh, a conflict that might degenerate. So, buy it. Thank you very much.